Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm pleased and thrilled to have uh, Lisa Stalekar, one of the greats of the game, with us uh, talking to me. Uh, welcome to this chat, Lisa. It's an honor and privilege to be with you. Uh, nearly 20 years after we first spoke via email. Yeah, a very long time ago. And you forwarded me the email back in 2001. So it was kind of cool to, to see that correspondence. Lisa, uh, your story is nothing short of a fairy tale uh, in cricket. Let's start at the beginning. Can you recount for our viewers, listeners, about your early days in Pune and uh, the story about the orphanage and how you got adopted and you moved to Australia? Can you share, share about that story with our, uh, with our listeners and viewers? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, I was born um, in Pune and uh, my biological parents checked into the hospital under a false name, gave birth and then off, um, off they went. Uh, luckily, there was an orphanage that was attached to, um, to the hospital. So I went there and uh, three weeks later, my uh, parents were looking actually for a boy and had gone to so many different orphanages and didn't quite connect or didn't feel like the right child was there. And <coughs> they said, um, I know you're looking for a boy, but why don't you go see this, this little girl that's there? And um, they did that and uh, they fell in love with me straight away. So, so got adopted. And uh, you were called Layla earlier and then you turned to Lisa. Is that true? Uh, yeah, so I think in the orphanage they, they kind of gave me a name and um, my my family, um, my sister's name's Caprini Lisa Stalaker and they really liked Lisa and my sister wanted to call me Caprini as well and they said, well, no, we can't quite do that, can't have two Caprinis in the same family. But what they did was they, they switched the name. So my name's Lisa Caprini Stalaker and my sister's Caprini Lisa Stalaker. And have you gone back to India or to the orphanage since that uh, early years? <coughs> yeah, I went back uh, 2012 and it was quite fortuitous in the sense that um, I'd, I'd never really wanted to go back. I'd never really wanted to search for my biological parents or go to the orphanage or anything. But um, I'd written my book, Shaker, and we were launching it in India um, at the time. And the manager at the time said, come on, let's go try and find it. And uh, we were able to actually find it. And, and the fact was that the orphanage was moving from that original place uh, the following week. So um, I got to go where my parents went and I, I rang my father uh, that evening and I told him I went to the orphanage and he said, oh, did you walk up the little spiral stairs that take you to the newborn section? I said, yeah, I did. So um, it was kind of cool to be able to go back to where my parents were as well and where obviously I'd spent a bit of time but um, it was more the connection to the place of, of where my parents kind of first met me and um, yeah it was really nice to see all the work that they're doing there and um, obviously plenty of kids still there unfortunately but uh, it was um, it was quite emotional as well. Uh, do you have any memories at all of your early days in India after your move abroad and coming back to see your grandparents? In Pune, any memories at all? Yeah. yeah, so um, obviously I was adopted at three weeks of age and I moved to the States from then on. Um, but my father's mother was still alive. And uh, so uh, school holidays, we used to go back uh, to Bombay. Um, and we had uh, we owned a school at the time. So I was on school holidays and the rest of the, the school was still um, in full flight. And we used to live right at the top of the apartment which um, had all of the school facilities down below so I used to run amok running up and down the stairs and running in and out of classrooms knowing full well that I was the granddaughter of the headmistress so I could get away with anything um, but I, I had I have certainly um, really fond memories of Bombay um, in my school holidays flying kites gold spot eating pan playing carom all those type of things so that's why um, since probably playing playing the game and and also now retiring and commentating, uh, India is on my my first destination. Hope you know I hope to get work there and get plenty of work, and that's why at the moment I'm missing India because I'm normally over there covering the IPL. Uh, do you speak any Marathi or Hindi? <laughs> no, 
Um, I don't speak any Marathi. I'm trying to learn Hindi and uh, I'm, I'm actually watching Hindi movies and things like that and trying to pick up phrases and um, different things like that. So um, I'm starting to understand a few more words. And so if there's a sentence that, you know, thankfully a lot of you guys speak a few, you have a few English words. And then if I can understand a few Hindi words, then I can try and put it together and try and understand um, what you're saying. So my aim would be one day to be able to understand Hindi and, and hopefully to be able to speak it. Uh, in your book, you write about the fact that uh, it was your father who introduced you to cricket. And uh, you also said that unlike your sister who liked to read and sit in front of the television, you were an outdoors person. Can you tell us something about how you got initiated into cricket? And also there's a very interesting story about uh, your father going to a club in Sydney and uh, coming to know that even women play cricket over there. Can you yeah, tell us yeah. about that? Yeah, so growing up, um, I, I was certainly the outdoors kid. And, and in Australia, um, for those that not, have travelled to Australia, the weather's normally pretty good and you're normally outdoors running around, plenty of open spaces. So I literally you know, especially on the weekend or school holidays, I'd disappear, you know, after breakfast, I'd head out, disappear, go wandering, go searching, climbing trees, you name it. Um, and we also lived opposite um, a, a reserve. So big open bush space, I used to go wandering in there. Um, and I played all sorts of things and tried my hand at a lot of things. Um, but certainly sport was something that I enjoyed and, um, the first house we lived in Cherrybrook um, was opposite a tennis centre. So they had a tennis wall. So I used to run across the, the little little river and take my tennis racket and hit for hours upon hours against the wall. Um, and tennis was actually my first sport, was my first real passionate sport that I wanted to excel at. Um, cricket, obviously my father loved it. Um, he's Indian born and raised, so it's in your blood. and. Um, he used to take me out in the backyard and, and play it. And we used to play a little bit. But um, he used to take us to the SCG because uh, when he was a young little boy, his father used to take him to CCI to watch international matches. So he wanted to kind of pass on that those experiences. And um, I remember going to the SCG when, when I was young, probably seven or eight years of age, and I enjoyed it, you know, loved it. The atmosphere was great, Mexican wave, coloured clothing, day-night cricket, it's all exciting. Um, and I remember on a weekend, I noticed there was a lot of kids playing cricket and I said to Dad, oh, I want to play, can I try out? And I was, I was nine years of age and he said, I, I actually don't think girls play cricket. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, you look at all of the kids out there, they're all boys, like, I, I don't know of any women's cricket. Anyway, he went to the, the local uh, cricket club, which was uh, West Pennant Hills Cherry Brook, and, uh, and kind of inquired and said, my daughter would like to, to play. And they said, well, it's not really in our constitution. We don't have any girls in the club. And this is, uh, for Sydney, it's one of the biggest clubs in Sydney. And my father said, but can she play? And they said, well, yeah, I guess there's, there's no harm in it. You know, so I went uh, to the local um, school to try out for the under 10s and um, I remember turning up and I was in the car and I watched all I was watching all the boys in the nets and um, I found it really daunting I said oh, actually I don't want to go <laughs> I'm quite happy to just to play in the backyard with your dad I said no 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 off you go so he kind of kicked me out and um, in the first match I picked up a wicket within my first delivery so from then on the boys loved me because they could uh, pay out their other mates who got out by a girl. So, um, yeah, that's how, how I kind of started playing cricket. But like I said, tennis was actually my first love and cricket was just um, more the social sport. And it, I, and it probably switched when I was about 15, 16 years of age. There's another funny incident that you've written about in your book and that relates to a man uh, when you used to wear, in your own words, long pants and put your cap on and play against the boys and then you trip. And then the guys realized that you're actually a girl. What do I, I think, was that under 60s? Is that, is that it? Okay? Uh, no, it was, it was probably, so under 10s, I got away with it a fair bit. Um, so I think the first two years, if my memory serves me well, our side was really good. So we actually won um, the competition and we were so dominant that they decided to put us up a level. So not only was I playing with the boys, um, but I was also playing 
up an age group as well. So I think it was during that stage that, um, you know, I just wanted to blend in. I didn't want to be noticed. Uh, I didn't want the other older guys to kind of go, oh, look at that girl. So back then I didn't even know that women wore culottes because I didn't even know women's cricket existed. But I wore the pants. Um, I have long hair and my hair's in a ponytail, so I used to do it like that. And then I used to just tuck it under and just keep my head down. And this was the days of you didn't have to wear a helmet whilst batting. So um, I, I was running between the wickets and my hat fell off. So obviously my hair became noticeable and one boy shouted out, Oi, that bloke's a girl. So I didn't realise it was such a good disguise until finally they kind of admitted that they thought I was a boy. So I, I did fairly well to get away with it for as long as I did. And uh, when you got picked for your first competitive match at the age of 14, your sister gave you a very special gift, a pillow with a message on it. Uh, can you tell us about that? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was, I, I didn't make the New South Wales side for the under 18 national championship, but they had an invitational side that they put together. So I was in that side. Um, and um, I don't, I'm, I'm sure I have the pillow still. I, I must be in storage or something. But basically it was a pillow and um, it was, um, please don't wake me, I'm dreaming about representing cricket for my country or for Australia. And I had a little picture of me, you know, with brown fuzzy hair and everything. And it was a really cute picture and, um, and a good message. And it was probably around that age. So I would have been, I think, 15. Um, it was then I started to kind of go, well, obviously I started to realise that females played cricket. There was an Australian team, World Cups, domestic competition. And that's when I kind of went, well, hang on, let's see how far I can go. So, um, yeah, that pillow was kind of a nice reminder, probably the start of, of that kind of fire that, that ignited into me to, to try and be the best that I could be. But studies was also very important. You majored in psychology and religious studies from Sydney University. Uh, how much has that grounded you as a cricketer and as a person? Well, um, studies, yes, whilst it's very important, and I urge all the young boys and girls to make sure you, you study, it didn't come naturally to me. Like, my father is a brainiac. He, um, I think he has three doctorate degrees. He's got, I think, over 10 degrees in so many different fields. Uh, it certainly didn't rub off on me, but he always instilled that studying, getting qualifications was really important. And I, and I think it actually teaches you a lot of lesson, discipline, being able to hand things in on time, to be able to work sufficiently by yourself, work with, you know, other members of the classroom, whatever it may be, which I think are really important lessons. So, um, you know, I, I was daddy's little girl. So from a young age, I followed him around and did whatever he did. And my father at the time was a psychologist. He was actually a counsellor, hypnotherapist, and then became a sports psychologist. So I decided to study psychology, um, which was really good. But I did a Bachelor of Arts and I majored in a science subject. So I had to pick another one. My father was actually, um, before he was a minister uh, and had studied um, religion and gotten a doctorate in that. So I decided to do religious studies as well. So literally daddy's little girl. Um, and look, it was, um, I th thoroughly enjoyed it and enjoyed learning. I never enjoyed the assessments and the exam time. Uh, that would stress me out. I'd rather go out in front of a crowd and play cricket than try and do an exam. And I still have a nightmare that I still haven't finished my university degree or my HSC. So it's a recurring theme that I tend to have. But um, the main thing was that I got the degree. And in the end, I haven't necessarily had to use it because I, I then got a full-time job with cricket. But I certainly understood the, under, the, the, I guess, a bit more of the psyche of, of everyone. And then also religious studies, um, when you're playing cricket across the world, you come up against different people with different religions and probably allowed me to understand culturally why things are slightly different in this country compared to my country. So um, I think it certainly has helped me in the long term to get that that base, that grounding, that platform, um, that understanding. Uh, when you made it to the Australian team on the 2001 Ashes Tour, and that's when I noticed you first because there was a photo on Getty Images. Uh, in the sense that you got injured uh, and 
uh, at the SCG and you almost didn't make it to that tour. Uh, what was that moment like? <laughs> yeah, um, so Sally Bailey was our fitness advisor. And uh, the, the day before we, um, no, I think we were flying out that afternoon, evening. So that morning off we went to do a fitness session. So we were running from our hotel and we were running around to the SCG and um, just didn't get my footing right and went over my ankle, and rolled it and did, um, I think a grade, I think it was a level two or grade two tear of my ankle. So that flight from Sydney to London <laughs> um, with an injury like that, I was in a lot of pain. Thankfully, I found uh, they were able to find me some seats where I could elevate my leg, but it was constantly throbbing. Um, so, yeah, my first tour with the Australian side, I think the first week and a bit was in rehab, walking, physio all the time. Lisa Ross was our physio, excellent physio. Um, and then slowly trying to get ready and back to playing. And then when I started to get into training full-time, then my quad went, which always is the case. When you're coming back from in injury, you kind of try and look after that injury so you put more weight, more pressure on a certain other, other type of muscle and that normally goes. So then I did my quad. Um, so then, yeah, that, it took a couple, you know, another week for that to be sorted and... Um, I think the test matches were first anyway, and I, I was never going to play the test matches. So I had that, that period of time to, to, to recover and get ready for the one-day games where I made my debut. But not the start you're kind of looking forward to, to when you first go on an international tour, but certainly um, I learned a lot of lessons from that tour. I, I ran the drinks a lot. I didn't like it, but I think it's something of... Uh, it's part of the journey of a cricketer, you know, when you get selected young, you've got to do the hard yards and try and learn as much as you did. And, and that's exactly what I did. You made your test debut in 2003, but unfortunately your mother was not around to see it. Uh, was it a bittersweet moment for you? Yeah, I thought, yeah I'd say so. Um, uh, so I think she passed away the year before. Um, and I remember that it was the second test match where I, I scored my century uh, against England and we were in a bit of a tricky situation. And my, my good mate and my, my uh, room partner at the time, Alex Blackwell, we were able to put on a, a big stand to kind of get us out of, um, out of a hole. But I'd probably say that every time uh, things were successful, there was probably a, a moment where I was like, I wish mum was there watching. Uh, you were part of four World Cup winning uh, squads uh, in that particular uh, era. Uh, which one of them was uh, very special for you? Do you want a moment to gather yourself? Oh, no, no, it's okay. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, which, was the, which was the most special of that? That, that was a very big, uh, great era for Australian cricket when you were part of the team. Yeah, I was very fortunate to be part of an extremely successful side. And, and when I came into the side in 2001, uh, they had actually lost the World Cup in 2000. So you know, Belinda Clark was at the helm and she, and she had certain um, expectations of the team. We were very focused on what we needed to do. Um, so, yeah, so I was fortunate to learn, I guess, a lot of my international cricket during that time. Uh, out of the World Cup, so 250 overs and two T20s, obviously the first one is always really special and, and I got to share it with them. Um, some amazing cricketers that, you know, have gone down in, into the history books as legends of the game. So Belinda Clark was obviously our captain. Uh, Catherine Fitzpatrick, uh, fast bowler that led the way. Karen Rolton, our vice captain. Actually, just recently, it was the 15-year anniversary of, um, of that victory. So it was kind of nice just to relive that memory. So that certainly was a special one. And, and then I, you probably can't go past the last one, which was the 2013 um, where I ended my career, uh, it was uh, in Mumbai, um, you know, the, the second city that I call my home. Um, and a couple of uh, friends came out to watch that. So that was really special. And you're also the first woman cricketer to hold a unique record of 1,000 runs and 100 wickets in one-day internationals. You captained Australia uh, in three one-day internationals. Uh, uh, how special are these kind of achievements? Do you look back at 
a career fulfill do you feel that you retired at the right time in that sense after achieving all this uh yeah. I retired at the right time I, I guess i had seen in the men's game and the women's game absolute legends hold on for a little bit longer and obviously from a press point of view and even maybe from a teammate perspective, everyone's going, why are they still playing, you know? And I wanted to make sure that I left on my terms, that I didn't get a tap on the shoulder, that I didn't have people, why is she still in the field? She's slow, she's missing catch, whatever it may be. I wanted to still be able to contribute in all facets. I'd come into the side despite the fact that they had lost the World Cup. They were really the number one side within that, in, within that era. And, you know, I'd now gone through and played with three different generations, the players that I looked up to, my current, my current players or my current generation, and then the next generation, which was Elisa Healy, Elise Perry, Meg Lanning. And I just felt 2013 was the right time. Um, you know, we, there was an, uh, most Australian female cricketers retire after an Ashes because you normally have a World Cup you have a couple of months off, you go to England, play the Ashes and everyone retires. But I thought, you know, we were number one in all formats. So we had won back the Ashes. We'd won the T20 the year before in September in Sri Lanka. We'd just won the 50 over World Cup. I thought it was time to go, let everyone else have, you know, it was the next generation coming through. Um, Elise Perry was still batting down the order. She needed to come up. Um, yeah, it was the right time. Could I have gone on and played for another year, another tour or something? Yeah, I probably could have. But I felt that I'd achieved everything that I wanted to and uh, very happy to walk away when I did. Uh, you still hold the record for the most uh, women's National Cricket League games, uh, most wickets in that competition. Uh, and also you won the 2007-2008 uh, Belinda Clark medal twice in two years. Uh, all these accolades from your peers, in front of your peers, and still holding those records. Uh, how do you look back at that part of the game that you played in Australia in the domestic competition? Yeah, it means that certainly uh, I was I was an older player when I retired, so those records tend to stand. And obviously, with the change in format, with T Twenty cricket being the major format within with the women's game, means potentially you know the fifty over records will hold for a little bit longer. But certainly they'll be they'll be taken over by the next generation. Um, you know, I I came into the game because I, you know, I, I was playing an individual sport in tennis, but I enjoyed the team aspect of cricket, um, and that's why I I stayed with cricket. And uh, whilst the individual awards are nice and it's a nice recognition, the things that I remember the most are World Cup wins or series wins or um, domestic title wins, which, you know, like I said, I was fortunate enough to be part of an era of cricket where Australia and New South Wales dominated. So we didn't lose many times. Um, so they're the things that I hold dear and um, the silly stories that happens when you're on tour, you know, they're the, they're the memories that I cherish. It's, it's not the individual awards. Uh, you were also the first member of the Australian Cricketers Association uh, board, the first woman to be part of that board. How important was that position? Because uh, it sort of brought the female cricketers at the same level as the male cricketers. How important for you personally was that position? Yeah, really important. And, you know, there's a lot of cricketers and there's a lot of athletes that say they want to leave the game in a better place than, than what they found it. And then you don't often get too many opportunities to be able to do it. You, you may have aspirations to do it, but you don't get the, that chance. Um, female cricketers weren't part of the Australian Cricketers Association. Um, I remember speaking to Karen Rolton. She was the captain. So myself and her, we were captain and vice captain. We thought it was time that the female players became part of that association, um, you know, and we weren't necessarily looking for remuneration increases or anything like that. It was more about just gym access, training access, better training uniforms, better playing uniforms, because we were getting all the hand-me-downs from the men. And, you know, we've got some great photos of us, like, in massive training and playing kits because that was the only thing that was left. Um, so it was just those little things. And, and then, obviously, you fast forward 
you know, 15, 15 years or 10 years from when we probably first joined the ACA and the Australian female players are in such a good position and, you know, and to witness what we saw in that, uh, you know, the last competitive tournament that we've seen in this, in this world <laughs> um, was really special. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I feel like it was very important that females became part of the cricket psyche, the, the, just the cricket talk. It, wasn't, it shouldn't be just men's and then segregate women's cricket. We, it should just be cricket. And, and that was an important step. And post your retirement, you've slipped very easily and nicely into the commentary role. And most recently, we saw you getting emotional after Australia won the World Cup. Uh, how yeah, smooth has the transition been from being a cricketer to a broadcaster? Uh, how have you enjoyed this transition? Oh, I, I've loved it. Um, certainly, uh, I guess my generation, when you finish playing cricket, you go back to your career that you've been juggling whilst you've been playing. You go into cricket, as in sports administration, or you become a coach. Um, they were the three options um, as a female player. I'd already done the degree and didn't necessarily want to do that further. I was currently working at Cricket New South Wales, being a coach anyway, whilst I was juggling playing. And so after I retired, I stayed at Cricket New South Wales for a year. But I got bored because I'm used to doing that job in about nine months and fitting it all in with my training and I had 12 months to do everything and I needed a different challenge and um, certainly at, at that time there weren't any females involved in cricket broadcast yet I was an avid watcher follower um, and I loved the game and I thought you know why can't there be more obviously there were, whenever the women's matches were televised it was female commentators but I'm like I watch just as much men's cricket as my next door neighbor who's male so why can't there be a female voice so yeah so I started to kind of pursue that and uh, it wasn't until I left Cricket New South Wales that things started to open up um, opportunities came uh, it was it was it's a different industry it's totally different to as a player as a player you get on the field and you don't understand how many people go behind the scenes to make it happen. So that World Cup final, there would have been probably over 100 people there making sure that what we saw on the television box was perfect. Um, and obviously the commentators are, are the face and the voice of what goes on. But um, I was astounded about how many people are involved in a broadcast. And it's taken me a, time, uh, a fair bit of time to understand that, but also understand a new skill. Um, you know, I'm used to answering the questions like, I'm happy you throwing questions to me, but all of a sudden I had to come up with questions. I'm like, oh, what shall I ask the player? I don't know what to ask them. So it's a little bit harder to kind of flick that switch. And yeah, I've, had, I've been fortunate enough since I've come into the commentary box that um, the fellow male commentators have been so welcoming, um, very helpful. Um, feedback uh, has been coming aplenty. And um, yeah, hopefully... Uh, everyone's seen some improvement and uh, whilst I, I may not be everyone's cup of tea, hopefully within a family of four, someone likes me. One thing that we have noticed is that uh, in India, we remember Greg Matthews bowling with the cap, uh, yeah. Greg, Jeff Boycott bowling with the cap and then you. Uh, was that something uh, part of the Australian folklore or was it something that you picked up while you were playing in the younger days, bowling with the cap on? Yeah. Um... <coughs> It was actually got had Meg Matthews. Um, hang on. <coughs> um, yeah, it had nothing to do with Greg Matthews. It had everything to do with my hair being so big and fluffy and curly and a mess and basically wanting to look good for the guys. So I'd keep my cap on. And then I got used to it, obviously, as you grow up, bowling with your cap on so that I kept doing, take my cap off. It's only if I was bowling into the breeze and the breeze was quite stiff, that's when I'd take it off. But other than that, it was purely um, a habit I picked up when I was younger and just wanting to look good. Uh and I believe that away from cricket, you like cooking. And you, uh, they say that your guacamole is a uh, special dish that you prefer. 
uh, they, they, your friends love your go the your made homemade guacamole. Yeah, um, I certainly do enjoy cooking, and obviously, with what I'm doing at the moment, I'm constantly on the road and I'm constantly eating out. But this pandemic has <laughs> forced everyone to stay indoors, so it's given me a chance to cook, uh, learn a few more recipes. Um, yeah, most people are, are impressed with my Mexican dishes, um, and there's, a, I guess, a, a guacamole and a certain kind of sour cream, guacamole, tomatoes. Um, uh, dip that goes very well and, and people absolutely love it. It's very Moorish as well and it's probably not too healthy for you but um, every now and again it's a nice treat to have but yeah I love cooking. Uh, I learned that off my mother. Um, I spent plenty of times uh, in the kitchen with her when she wasn't well and I'd do the cooking and that's how I learned all of the family recipes. Final question to you is uh, can you give a message to all the people listening about the COVID-19 and what they must do to cope with it and how to keep active at this in these times? Yeah, look, um, we're, we're going through an, um, a really strange period at the moment and, and I know a lot of people are struggling, a lot of people have lost work. I've lost a lot of work as well. Um, we're, we're stuck at home. I think the, the, the main message is just listen to what the experts are saying. Um, you know, don't go out unless you really have to. I mean, I'm literally going out to exercise and go to the shops, you know, once once a week. And, and that's it. And I crave my friends and things like that. We've got to find other ways to, to interact. But one thing that I, I, I do really recommend is you have a routine. Otherwise, you you're probably going to bed at 2 a.m. sleeping till 10 to a routine because fingers crossed by us doing all the right things and listening to the health officials and, and the government, uh, we'll be going back to normal life and we've got to be able to transition pretty quickly as well. So um, just stay strong, stay safe, stay, stay healthy uh, uh, and uh, we'll get through this. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Lisa. Really appreciate you giving us time, and I hope to come to Sydney once and have uh, your uh, favorite dishes. No worries. Excellent. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. See you.